This time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Guinan gets a feeling. Hello, welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi review and critique show that just feels wrong somehow. Hmm. I am Skeff, when I'm joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Dr. Izix. Hi! And we are back to Star Trek after our weird and wacky movie, uh, which you should check out. I think that one was fun. Yes. I had a lot of fun recording it, a lot of fun watching the movie again, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still having fun today, in yeah. fact. So go go listen to the last episode, and um, I don't know if this episode is going to be good yet, because we haven't recorded it. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> We haven't recorded it before we recorded it for you to listen to. I know. Believe it or not, we do these things in in, in series. Like, we, we don't go back. We we record the whole episode at once. We're not doing weird editing stuff where we record the intro, like, a week after we record the rest of it or something, like, you on YouTube. Yeah, it would be kind of, uh, I guess, annoying for us if, if we did do that. But maybe someday we'll, like, do something like that just like to experiment and it'll confuse everyone including us and then it'll be terrible it would i mean i'm sure that uh like efficiency wise that would probably be better if we did a bunch of the intros and a bunch of the bodies and a bunch of the endings and then like spliced them together after the fact mm-hmm. i'm sure that that might be more efficient that it would be confusing as hell for us because we didn't go to film school or learn how to edit or anything we just yeah, we just do this uh, we don't have like someone keeping you know important notes about things we should make sure to mention when we uh, come back to uh, record the last part of the episode uh, after three weeks of not. Yeah, we barely you know. have notes at all. Yeah, <laughs> we mostly wing it. That's why I'm so bad about sources half the time. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes I cite sources and uh, and then I, f- I, f- I, f- I forget because I, I put that on a do- text document that's in and I have too many things open right now all the time so <laughs> yep anyway all that has nothing to do with um with the episode because it's time travel time travel episode mm-hmm. but one of the bad kinds of time travel that's not very fun at all yeah well the, the, the episode I'd say is pretty solid but uh this is the kind of time travel where yeah it just messes things up for everybody yeah the episode's pretty good but like there's two kinds of time travel in star trek there's the whippy we get to go back to the past and fuck around kind of time travel and there's Mm -hmm. we've messed up everything everyone is dead we've destroyed the future and we have to return to the past to maybe not mess it up as badly and create uber hitler and uh you know if we fail in the past it'll not only be uber hitler but like a clone of him too you know yeah and He's he's a borg yeah so so that'd be extra bad yeah, so um, oh. <laughs> this is the episode called Yesterday's Enterprise. Today. Tomorrow and yesterday. On, on Watchers of Tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and all our yesterday is in a steady pace of enterprise to enterprise. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, cut this uh, train off before we uh, get lost in tomorrow and yesterday. <laughs> yeah, or we could do like um, half of Hamlet. <laughs> hmm. No, there's, you know, all our yesterdays, I suppose. Anyway. (laughs) Sorry, this episode um, says it was uh, written by Ira Stephen Bear and Hans Blemmer and Ronald D. Moore and Richard Manning. Several of them we've talked about before. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Mostly it was just like all of the Star Trek writers came together to finish an episode for sweeps. Kind of, (laughs) yeah. Uh, this was kind of a, like, amalgam script. It was two different story ideas by people that got shoved together. Uh, Trent Christopher G- Ganinio, uh, Ganinio and Eric A. Stillwell uh, had uh, contributions to the story, yes? Yeah. Wait there. We can go over more of the... I don't know if we should go over it before or after. There's a whole lot of, like, this was written as a different thing to include a different character, and then they included another different character, and then they had a script to bring back another character, and mm-hmm. then that character was too expensive, so they brought back a different character instead. <laughs> uh, I, maybe uh, keeping it for a surprise will be uh, a better way to go yeah. forward. <laughs> Either you know this episode, know exactly who comes back, or you don't, and it will be a surprise, like they want it to be in the episode. Yes. Yeah, but uh, basically, um, to sum up, 
Uh, this is a lot of longtime Star Trek writers who made DS9. Yes. <laughs> Later. So. You're a- so if you like DS9, if you're one of those weirdos that thinks DS9 is a good show, so starting yeah. fights. <laughs> Mood to start some fights. <laughs> Uh, era Stephen Bear is the guy with the uh, sort of bluish purplish uh, beard and mustache thing going on, goatee. Yeah. So, uh, so if you if all else fails, you can identify him that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they basically uh, took the part of this episode that's what if the Federation was in a dark forever war, and they're like, what if we make that a series? Because then it would be great. We can write all the unpleasant characters. <laughs> Uh, I know Garrick is kind of unpleasant to the whole, you know, trying to murder people thing occasionally, but he's still such a, a cheery guy. Yeah, so fun. <laughs> anyway, we've got uh, guest stars. We've got several yes. guest stars, and I'm going to ruin the surprise at some point in the mm. guest stars. Yeah, I, I, we, we should probably let everyone know that Whoopi is in this one, yep. so... Yeah. She's not in all of them, but yeah. <laughs> Surprise. So we've got Christopher McDonald as Richard Costello. He had supporting and guest roles in the early 80s things, including Grease 2, The Boys Next Door, and Thelma and Louise, etc. Hmm. He's uh, best known for being the antagonist golfer in the movie Happy Gilmore. He's got oh, one of those yeah. faces that you like, I know that guy from something. Yeah, it's it's very uh, def- uh, defining, uh, definitive. Uh, it has features yeah. that you can define. And I know there's a lot of other random people running around. The other no- mm-hmm. the main notable guest star is Teresha O'Neill as Captain Rachel Garrett. She began on Broadway in the early 70s, uh, then moved into film roles that I'm not going to read the name of because I'm not going to say that word mm-hmm. uh you mean uh, titans <laughs> yeah i hate titans <laughs> anyway it's on our wikipedia page so uh i think it's the one from 1972 if you want to look it up and read it um no yeah uh, i i don't i don't think uh i don't think that's worth my time here yeah so, so uh, you know if anybody wants yeah. to go read it you can i'm not gonna say it anyway it was, uh mm. in the 1997 titanic and was in a lot of TV shows like Columbo, uh, other Guyver. similar mystery series, Fall Guy, Airwolf. I feel like we're around around the time when someone's thinking about making an Airwolf movie, aren't we? Probably. Uh, she was uh, also in uh, an episode of Babylon 5 called Believers. Yeah. Several episodes, according to the notes I found. Uh well, she was also in uh, Babylon 5 in the beginning as the Earth Lion's president, ah. um, which is technically a TV movie, but kind of part of the series. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it feels like we're splitting hairs there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, in Believers, I think she was the mom, uh, alien mom of the kid that was dying if they didn't do surgery. But she had like a belief system that's like, yeah, if you do that. It means your soul escapes, and there's it's a whole episode. Sounds like just sci-fi house. Kinda. Okay. Uh, but but uh, uh, for, uh, Dr. Franklin's a, a bit more personal. <laughs> and she's going to come back on Star Trek as both a Cardassian and a Klingon. Hmm. Excellent. Then finally, I have one more guest star that i got to talk about. Uh, Denise Crosby is Surprise. returning as Tasha Yar. Yes. Because uh, I think we might have mentioned her before, like a season or two ago. Yeah, uh, you know she's uh, you know just just a, a regular who's uh, just back to be a regular. Yeah, huh. totally. So let's see. After Tasha was killed off in the first season, <laughs> Crosby missed Spoilers. being part of the show. We we already covered that one. It's not a spoiler when we covered that <laughs> one. <laughs> I assume that everyone who's listening is listening to this series in order because you somehow got past my poor editing decisions in the first three episodes. Well, uh, if that's the case, uh, huzzah, yeah. uh, but if uh, not, welcome to the to the podcast. Uh, we uh, cover science fiction, mostly a lot of Star Trek. I should probably stop this at this point. So they um, had a meeting. She had a meeting with some of the writers uh, to discuss maybe bringing Tasha back for an episode or two. They wrote something that was going to include both Tasha and Spock. Then Gene Roddenberry said Spock is too expensive. And they were like, what about Spock's dad? He's like, yeah, fine. He's cheap. 
Um, mm-hmm. Then they were going to time travel through Vulcan history, which could have been kind of interesting. Um, but yeah. then they got a spec script for a time traveling Enterprise C that included an ensign who went back in time to get killed, and they went, "Hey, what if we send you back in time to get killed instead?" Oh, yeah, it, would, it would fit, you know. Uh, we're dealing with alternative timeline stuff here, uh, so why not? Yeah. So there we go. That's um, that's why she's showing up again. Yes. Hmm. Though I would like to see. Tasha and Sarek time traveling through Vulcan history to save the invention of logic. That sounds kind <laughs> of interesting. I have to agree, actually. Uh, so I going- do feel like I don't know what you do with the rest of the cast, but uh, sounds interesting. Well, well uh, we could always uh, pull a thing where uh, you know one of the rest of the cast uh, uh, goes along with. Uh, ideally, someone who doesn't get uh, utilized uh, uh, very well in. Uh, you know, uh, sort of these uh, time travel uh, sort of uh, uh, things here. So uh, I'd, I'd vote for either um, Diana, Crusher, or uh, Jordy at this point. Because, uh, you know, he you know, really hasn't done it yet, but, you know, Data has his own mm-hmm. uh, a bit of an uh, adventure later. Well, you have to uh, do Diana because then they can have a, like, thing where she's all guilt-ridden about how Tasha sacrificed herself to save her from the goo monster. Oh, yeah, here we go. So, yeah. Hmm. Then you can be as angsty as they like to be for the people who went on to write DS9, the angstiest of the Star Treks. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, it, but now at this point, we could probably like make it a whole series. Yeah. I mean, it so, honestly uh, sounds like um, Crisis Point 2 from Lower Decks. <laughs> <laughs> like we've got to save uh, the ambassador's whatever's ancestor, the giant squid at the zoo. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, there's a story here that's not Crisis Point 2 Lower Decks, which is like those are weirdly, weirdly good episodes in season one and two. If you haven't seen Agreed. Lower Decks. So, uh, go watch Lower Decks uh, after you listen to this podcast. Yeah, you probably should. We could talk about Lower Decks. Someone yeah. someone tell us to start a Patreon so we can talk about Lower Decks. Yes. Uh, yeah. Leave it in the comments or uh, write a review. It's like this is the best podcast ever. Uh, except they don't talk about lower decks yeah. yet. And oh, I want, and we can I have them. we could get enough money to commission somebody to draw us as lower decks characters. Ah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, um, back back in non-animated Star Trek. Not yet, at least. Ho <laughs> ho. Uh, did you see? There was this thing going around for a while where someone did um, original animated series versions of like uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation and Voyager. Yes, they were so yes, good. Uh, yeah, you know, just to take the audio and uh, you know uh, do the animation for it. And, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they even like purposely put in like the like artificial dust and smudging that would have been mm-hmm. on a on a poorly used animation plate. It was great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think I shared at least one of those in the uh, the Discord. Uh, yeah. FYI, we have a Discord. Yeah, we have a Discord, Discord interested. where you can go look at so, us, uh, not interact with stuff, but share things occasionally. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Anyway, there's a, there's Worf. Worf is doing a thing in Ten Forward with Guinan. Um, mm-hmm. He's learning about uh, the most important drink for uh, for the rest of his character. Yeah. Um, firstly, out. she's trying to convince him to have rough, kinky sex with some other crewmates, <laughs> and then she introduces him to prune juice, which just becomes like his thing forever. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting, given which of the two options they had to make his thing forever, they took prune juice instead of rough, kinky Klingon sex. <laughs> well, he does get to have some of that later, but, does. you know. <laughs> but, like, the whole line is like, I would require a Klingon woman. It's like, some of the women on board might surprise you. It's like, hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I hear some scary things about what Crusher's able to do. <laughs> <laughs> you've seen those, you've seen the weird stretches they were doing in this. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, there's a weird hole in space you know, by, suddenly outside, and everybody gets called to the bridge. Uh, the thing mm. outside ain't there. Uh, you know, they can't detect it in any way. They can just see that there's a big space hole. Yes. Hmm. It's like a pot's hole in space. You know, if everyone's trying to ignore it, but you can obviously see it's there. There's also radiation that they've never detected before. Hmm. Is it plot radiation? Yeah, it's plot radiation. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they think they detect a ship for like a second, uh, but then it's gone and they shrug it off and move on. 
and Guinan mm-hmm. calls the bridge to ask if everyone's okay, and Jordy tells her about Tasha. Yeah, and it was a really short uh, episode. And, yeah, somehow uh, Worf ended up teleporting the bridge too. I'm not sure if that's just a continuity error or whatever, but yeah. yeah. Well, no, they still like he got called up to the bridge and then left and went oh. to the bridge, like oh. the time hole. Yeah. Hmm. So, so, so I guess we probably just cut ahead a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So anybody who didn't remember that episode will get this was a joke in like 20 minutes or so. Yes. <laughs> so it would be funny if we just go into the discussion. <laughs> what appears to be a five minute episode. <laughs> yeah. So the thing about kinky Klingon sex and prune juice. <laughs> It's weird they had an episode that focused so much on that exclusively. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Just you can read the out. space hole as a metaphor for the Clinky's king on sex and prune juice. Yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, you know, the kinky king on sex involves openings and, uh, you know, prune juice is helping a different opening uh, re- maintain regularity. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or possibly the same opening, depending on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, well, I, well, we don't know the full gamut of uh, Klingon uh, anatomy, uh, you know, so. Yeah, you know. but if there's one thing we know about humans, it's they're going to use any opening going. Yes, and maybe Klingons need uh, all the openings uh, available uh, for uh, general sex anyway. Yeah, so. it's because of all those redundant organs. Mm-hmm. So that's the episode, everybody. <laughs> yeah, now, I don't think we can, I don't think, um, they, I don't know. I, yeah, we're we're like. 10 minutes in we're at least 10 minutes in youtube's not going to completely shut us down for this now <laughs> oh god so uh what actually happened I, I, I don't know <laughs> i should go back to just being i should go back to just being shut down and not not talking as much when we're doing these <laughs> so so what really happens in the actual continuity of the episode is that a ship emerges from the anomaly and we see everything suddenly change. There's a different bridge layout. There's different uniforms. Everything got grim dark. Uh, and instead of Worf, Lieutenant Yar is at tactical. Gepwin, I think there's something wrong here. That Federation starship is out there and it's old. <laughs> By the way, this is my grim dark version. The grim dark voice. <laughs> Yeah. And they're in a grim dark universe, which means that the Enterprise was, just saw a ship come out of the warp, probably infested mm-hmm. by demons and heretics. Uh, and uh, the Tyranids or something like that. Yeah, gene stealers. And uh, some, some orcs, space orcs. All together, uh, they're, they're probably going to like kill each other, but you know. Yeah, they're, they're currently having a big battle on that ship, and... Uh, we should just wait them out and then blow the thing up just to be sure. Though in 10 Forward, Gaiden notices something is wrong, but she can't really put her finger on what because she like is a being that has a different interaction with time than everybody else. Mm, different perceptions. Mm, I don't trust it. So Yar identifies the ship as Federation uh, NCC-1701C, the USS Enterprise. Recorded mm. as destroyed about 20 years ago. Hmm. This is very convenient to just pop up now. Yeah, it's very suspicious. Suspicious. So they need to destroy it, and then, like, that'll win them the war, and they have to live with the consequences of that, and it's very dark and dour, and Mm. we'll win an Emmy or something. Yeah. I need to stop. I'm going to spend the entire episode making fun of DS9 if I don't stop. You you could just tell me to stop doing this voice. That might help. Yeah, you probably should. (laughs) Okay, I'll I'll stop doing that. (laughs) The grim darkness of Star Trek. There is only war. (laughs) War. War in space never changes. War never changes. (laughs) Well, that's the nice thing about Worf's name, though. Uh, it, it can fit in so many different, uh, you know, in place of other words. Yeah. So, you know, war to Worf. Uh, so, uh, you know, you know, warp to Worf. Um, wobble to Worf. So I'm getting all uh, warfery. The Worf wobbles, but <laughs> doesn't fall down. <laughs> yeah, so uh, apparently uh, uh, Worf isn't on the Enterprise of this uh, you know, alternative timeline. Who knows? He might be dead, dead out yeah. there somewhere. Well, probably. We don't know yet, but we don't know what's going on yet either. So, mm-hmm. Anyway, the ship's damaged. There's some life signs. Uh, Riker prepares to send over medical teams, but cards like uh, timeline shit, though. Yeah. <laughs> this, you know, if this is time travel nonsense, you know, that, this could be a problem. Uh, we haven't reinvented a temporal prime directive yet, but, um, you know, huh. just in case. Then Captain Garrett sends out a distress call. 
And Picard as well. Fuck. Fine. I guess we'll be like not terrible to them. Yeah. Go help, but don't tell them what's going on. So mm-hmm. Riker and Yar and a medical team head over to the Enterprise's seas bridge where they find the captain in her chair, as they should be. Find the helmsman, Lieutenant Castillo, under some rubble. And the away team thinks the ship might be salvageable. And the Federation could use every ship they can get because of their war with the Klingons. Dun, 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 But sensors have detected Klingon ships on the way, so if they can't repair her soon, they'll have to evacuate it and scuttle her. Hmm. I do like that word, though, scuttle. Yeah. I wonder where the origin of that is from, because it's such a weird word for destroying a ship. Maybe, um, I don't know, the you know, sea crabs or yeah, something like that? Yeah, send it down to the crab. <laughs> it'll scuttle all over. <laughs> scuttle, scuttle. I doubt it. Then Guinan shows up on the bridge because she thinks everything is wrong and she can't really say why, but they're not supposed to be in a war. Your uniform is stupid. It's supposed to be more fashion. Kinda, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, there's like steps on the bridge and like there's a, a, a weird set dressing everywhere yeah. and, it's, and all the lights are off. The bridge and, is way uh, less wheelchair kinda... accessible all of a sudden. Yeah. Hmm. And also there's supposed to be children and families and laughter. The, the joy, it's left our, our starship Enterprise here, Captain. His family is on a warship. It's like, you're not at war. Don't you understand yet? This is not, not hard. Uh, probably because that ship showed up, and uh, you need to send it back. Indeed. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I guess we got to trust your feeling. All right, let's just shove them back in the hole. Yeah, got, back, uh, to the, uh, back uh, in the record. hole with you. Be gone. <laughs> <laughs> so Picard heads to sick bay to see if his uh, counterpart, Captain Garrett, knows what's going on. She catches on way too quick. She's like, hey, you're from the future, aren't you? Tell me the name of this ship, why don't you? (laughs) Fine. (laughs) So right before they came to the future, they were defending a Klingon outpost from three Romulan warbirds. Uh, They were going to be destroyed, and if they go back, they will die instantly. Um, But it's Hmm. too bad that they didn't save the outpost because it might have prevented this entire war. Well, uh, uh... So bad on you for uh, traveling through time, uh, yeah. Captain. How could you have done that? Are we catching on yet? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, Yar and Castillo are hanging out a lot. They're repairing the Enterprise C. Um, he's a bit freaked out about how uh, time travel shit saved him from certain death. Mm-hmm. He's like, hey, so Wouldn't everyone you? I know is probably dead, right? And she's like, now nah, that has how we remember our lasers are better now. Well, yeah, and uh, so you know, it's only been you know a couple decades. You know, uh, you know they're probably fine, right? You know, oh uh, uh, yeah, they 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 were set up on this uh, you know a uh, uh, planet uh, on the uh, border of the Klingons on uh, the Arcanus sector. Uh, you know that one bit of, that ages ago that Klingons were all uh, uh, up in arms about and might be again someday. Yeah, so uh, you know, hopefully they're a okay on the colony that would be easily taken by the Klingons during a war. Wait a moment. <laughs> So he's mostly freaked about time travel. <laughs> She's like, hey, our tactical systems have improved, and this is apparently flirting. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess uh, for certain sorts of nerds, which I guess both of them are, this this works, actually. <laughs> Data confirms that the rift is a two-way rift. They could send the sea back, and it will appear right where it left and be immediately mm-hmm. destroyed. Garrett fights with the doctor because she's a captain and you just have to keep those consistent in this series. Yes. <laughs> she's not just a captain, but a captain of an enterprise. Yeah. So <laughs> she returns to her ship and Castillo has officially made the liaison for the enterprise D because he seems to be getting along with someone here. Yeah. yeah. You seem to have uh, made a friend. So you can use that. Uh, if we need to suddenly have a, 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 a turn of uh, face and betrayal, uh, or if you just need to be a liaison, either one works. So, Guinan tries to convince Picard to send everyone back. It'll fix the present, it'll end the war, it'll save thousands of lives. And he goes, but uh, if you're wrong and it doesn't end the war, I will have sent 100 plus people back to die for absolutely no reason. Hmm. Well, uh, I guess that's your Star Trek dilemma for today, uh, Picard. Uh, have fun! Yeah. So, Yarn Castillo head back to 10 forward. Uh, Guinan looks at Yar with something akin to horror. Um, and then she's called away before they can talk about it. She doesn't like Yar's hair too. Yeah, it is a little odd in this one. Yeah. <laughs> so in the briefing, Picard explains that he will in fact be sending the Enterprise C back. Hopefully, uh, they can end the war before it ever began. Well, you know, um, Picard, nobody likes this. Everyone's like, oh, um, this is bad. But he's like, well, I'm the captain, too bad. You know, uh, this is uh, a bit more uh, 
you know, authoritarian sort of vibes going on here. So uh, do what I say. Yeah, because there's a war on. And at some yeah. point in their data points out that even if they'd been destroyed, the Klingons might go, ooh, so honorable. We don't want to kill them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, those, the Klingons are kind of weird with honor sometimes, but, you know, going in to try to save them and losing your life as part of that, no. that's seen as like a, a good gesture at the very least. So Garrett is surprisingly okay with this. Picard reveals that the Federation is probably about six months away from surrender anyway. Uh, so if this war never happened, that would probably be better. Hmm. Yes. Uh, and uh, but, uh, the uh, the death toll is, you know, not in the thousands here. It's actually like at one point mentioned like 40 billion. Yeah. Which so, is like what you get when you have, you know, interstellar conflicts mm-hmm. with entire like other Earth sized planets. Yes. And you know, the, the, the Federation, you know, not counting, you know, uh, settling of colonies and things like that. Uh, you know, has you know dozens and dozens of home worlds involved in it, and if like even a few of those are uh, taken and bombarded by the Klingons or something like that, that yeah, th- those numbers can uh, you know really pile up pretty quickly. There's something that I always enjoy with Star Trek of like you're in like this first Cold War, then Alliance, then sort of war, depending on which series you're in with the Klingons, but then mm-hmm. they're solidly allies later, and it's fine. But, like, there's always this complete undercurrent of, like, they could come in and kill all of you whenever they wanted. They just don't feel like it right now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I guess there is a few times where that's specifically not the case. Uh, Like, uh, Errand of Mercy. Uh, It's like, yeah, we'll probably... uh, be able to beat down their ships pretty easily because our stuff's just better. So, you know, this war, yeah, we're totally going to win it. Um, but yeah, other times it's like, yeah, let's maybe just let them be and be their friends if possible. (laughs) I guess in the uh, late DS nine era, uh, you know, the, uh, Klingons are uh, kind of beaten down, taking enough losses that it's sort of a, uh, a situation where, you know, they're probably not going to be a major uh, a threat for uh, anybody for at least a few decades That's as true. they have to rebuild. And yeah, I think it's just interesting, especially moving to like just the like pre and post Cold War eras that mm-hmm. they start the Klingons as, yeah, we're sort of on equal footing. We're probably better, but it's best for everyone if we like avoid all of the terrible, unnecessary bloodshed. And yes. then by the time you get to next gen, it's like, oh, no, we would lose. Like, no question. No question we would lose. Uh, also, I guess, uh, you know, after sort of the, uh, you know, having an armistice and uh, chilling out for a few decades post uh, Star Trek VI, uh, Federation gets back to, it's like, yeah, we're going to be just like keeping the peace a little bit in our own territory, but mostly exploring in terms of our uh, starship uh, layouts. So uh, we're not really gearing up for, you know, conflict while the con- uh, Klingons are always carrying up for war because that's one of the things that they do for fun. So anyway, um, they're going to send them all back to the past. Yar has to say goodbye to Lieutenant Cleo and etc. Uh, and just before they leave, a warbird appears and begins firing on the ship. They're able to scare them <laughs> off because it's, you know, two ships against one. But Captain Garrett is mm-hmm. killed in an explosion. Oh no! Um, though... I, I do want to point out the uh, the weird uh, collection of uh, like foam debris things that they kind of have <laughs> with the explosion, because uh, we have we make use of the same stuff uh, in a later scene where there's another explosion that horribly uh, murders somebody, um, and so uh, yeah, it's just sort of like all right, well, this seems like the sort of material you'd have if there was an explosion in say a cave, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you but know, you don't coming. know what they make these ships out of. <laughs> are, are you telling uh, me that these are rocket ships? Yes. yes every rocket. panel above the bridge is filled with boulders. <laughs> and every, uh, you know, a conduit underneath the uh, the bridge is filled with, pl- uh, you know, high energy plasma. Yeah. So <laughs> it's one of those spark factories that they used to have in like music videos. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, start me up, do, 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 kind of start me up. <laughs> so now that the captain is dead, Castillo is the only ranking officer left alive, which means it's his ship now. Hmm. So he's a lieutenant, and uh, I guess everyone else is either a lieutenant or uh, ensign left on the ship, uh, no, lieutenant commanders. 
Mm. So he's prepared to lead the ship back, but they're very damaged, and they have no captain, so he's dubious whether they would be able to last long enough to make much of an impact. So they mm. agree to at least get the shields back up and running for a few hours they have before the Klingons return, even though it's a bad idea to hang around, and that the Klingons know where you are. Yes. Uh, yeah, Yar uh, says oh. goodbye to Castillo again, and this time they get to kiss. So, Hooray! Yay. She then heads to 10 forward to point blank ask Guinan what happens to her in the other timeline that they're trying to get to. She says, yeah, you're dead. Uh, pointlessly and oh. meaninglessly. Sorry. Hmm. Well, maybe I can uh, get in a fist fight with a uh, dinosaur this uh, this t- uh, time around. Uh, is there any Gorn around? <laughs> so, yeah, she doesn't like that. And she requests a transfer to the Enterprise C to replace their tactical officer. Uh, and after she explains that she doesn't want to die a terrible, pointless death, uh, Picard agrees. Hmm. All right. Yeah, you're good, probably going to die either way. Uh, at least this way you might have something cool happen. So she does a big sneak up reveal to tell Castillo that she's uh, here and will take her place at Tactical now. Also, Gepwin, uh, we're, we're, we're comfortable with uh, him enough. We can call him Richard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Call me <laughs> Richard. Captain Richard. <laughs> Rich to my friends. <laughs> Cap rich if you're feeling saucy, <laughs> or if you want to go real so- uh, saucy, dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're back to uh, we're gonna be back to the Klingon thing in a minute. It's fine. <laughs> yes. So the Klingons return as the sea is heading towards the rift again. Makar engages the three battleships to try to defend the sea until they escape. They take lots and lots of damage. Um, they do manage to fight their way out, destroying one Klingon ship disabling the other but the engines take a lot of damage they're two minutes from a core breach the sea is 50 seconds away the bridge explodes rikers killed no one's at the con uh the klingons demand surrender picard says fuck you and jumps over the back of the tactical console to start firing the weapons himself as the entire bridge is on fire yeah well picard's been in this situation before yeah uh, even in alternative timeline, the Stargazer probably had a bad time that one time. Mm. So I just like this is like as much action as they let Picard have most of the time. And he's just yes. loving it. He's just like fucking jumping over shit. It's like like hell, you'll never take me alive. Aha. Yeah, uh, you know, well, Patrick Stewart gets a lot of good uh, opportunities to be, you know, both action star in this episode and like super actor guy yeah it's like we have a moral dilemma i'm telling you what's up uh you know i've thought about this but this is what's gonna happen so <laughs> so as soon as the enterprise c reaches the rift everything returns to normal they think they detected a ship for just a second but now it's gone and they all sort of shrug <laughs> it off and move on and guinan calls the bridge to ask if everything is okay and then turns around and asks jordy to tell her about tashi yeah hmm. well uh I guess we got back to normal here. Yeah. We, but what but what about our, our grim darkness? Oh, uh, that'll be back in four seasons. I think that's when DS9 starts up. Alright, I'll I'll hold on to this voice for then. And then they do then DS9 does like two seasons of fucking around before they fully get into their like war is hell. It's easy to be it's easy to have paradise in peacetime. Now the real men have to make the hard decisions. Well, they have to deal with a, uh, a post-occupation uh, uh, Bajor, uh, a.k.a. Uh, a, a pseudo Marshall Plan thing going on, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, with the provisional government and people uh, trying to, uh, you know, cause a ruckus with all that. So, you know, got to settle a few things first. Yeah, but then they think that's mm-hmm. boring and they have to do, like, war as hell. Good times breed soft men. And uh, also uh, a, a bit of, uh, huh, our ratings aren't doing well, um... We'll bring Worf over. Yeah. You know, the next Generation show's done, so, you know, he's free. We right? liked Worf. <laughs> Worf was fun. Let's bring him over and forget everything that we established about his character. You know, well, it's either this or Michael Dorn goes off and, uh, you know, uh, stars in the, uh, uh, you know, sequel to uh, 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 The Man from Earth. Wait, he went and did that anyway. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh, no. Why? Why did they drag him into that? <laughs> They needed a guy that played a uh, a, a dude, uh, I guess. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, d- did uh, history uh, remember the name Enterprise? You probably usually, yeah. But yeah, that particular line though from the episode uh, is definitely one of my favorites, and uh, you know, you could sort of say it as the thesis for the series. I think it's kind of interesting that like history remembers the name Enterprise now because of this show. Mm-hmm. It's been a battleship and various things for for years, and, and no one would probably think that much of it, except for, like, it's connected to this now. Yep. 
<laughs> and uh, Star Trek even inspired a space shuttle name. So, <laughs> hmm. I think this is one of the. This one's going to be. This is a little interesting. It's one of the more straightforward message episodes. It's like you're. You got a pretty good pass with Guinan being able to do some sort of weird extrasensory time perception stuff. Mm-hmm. Being able to just go like. Hey, this is what happened. I am an alien with weird knowledge of alternate timelines, so I can tell you what's going on. Indeed. There would probably be a bit more of an interesting discussion if it was, we think that this ship might have been able to change things, and we're just surmising this. So we need to make a really tough decision about whether or not to sacrifice 100 people. Yeah, I guess... uh... You know, one uh, way to maybe do that would uh, require uh, changing up what's going on the other side, the time uh, uh, rift there. That maybe they haven't quite arrived at the battle where they fell into this uh, time thing. Uh, And uh, so they're like, yeah, we were trying to uh, help out some of uh, these Klingons here because we're in the middle of negotiations for a formal alliance. Yeah, (laughs) They asked for help and, you know, we've already been doing, you know, uh, stuff like this uh, previously. Um, but it's very so. It's very important we continue to be uh, you know, helpful in this uh, you know sort of stuff here. Yeah, you know, we don't know what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And then you know the uh, modern uh, you know pr- you know present uh, enterprise is like yeah we uh, remember you know, we have records about what happened to that outpost. It was completely destroyed, and uh, you know we're not entirely sure why. Or the you know Romulans claimed it, or something like that. Um, to say that yeah you know, there was you know very clearly a a bad end for whatever happened here. Uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the enterprise, you know, then you have a less certain death in that case. Uh, and thus the dilemma is this might be your end, but it might not, but it will at the very least give us a fighting chance in the present to not have this, uh, terrible timeline that's happened here. Um, so I think I'd change that. I'd change like two other things they should have. Mm hmm what you're saying they hadn't gotten there so you don't know it's going to be certain death or not but yeah. then uh the klingons still attack and they get damaged and then it probably will be certain death because they don't mm-hmm. have a full functioning ship anymore yeah <laughs> uh and so uh yeah heck maybe uh in the uh, the returned timeline uh you know the there was maybe you know a snafu with the uh, the attack on the that particular colony or outpost where uh, the uh, uh, Klingons actually felt bad because it looked like their sh- the the, uh, the ship coming to help had actually been hit by Klingons at some point. Well, they were even like, "Oh, this <laughs> ship came in, even damaged." They tried to defend us. How honorable! Mm. Yeah. Yes. But the other oh, thing yeah. that I would change is they gave themselves way too they gave themselves too many easy outs for this episode to be able to comment on the stuff it's doing very much. They have Guinan's magic, we know what's happening stuff. But they also get to say, well, it doesn't really matter whether we send you back to die because we're all going to die anyway. Yeah. We're losing this war terribly and we're about six months from total Klingon subjugation. Though uh, most of the crew doesn't know that, you know, because it seems like captain's uh, information only. Yeah. There. But so hmm. it's too easy. If they weren't losing the war, if they were either doing fine or even winning but slowly, or even like we're six months away from winning, but maybe the price we paid is too high and it would be better to have stopped this before it began. You could still have the uh, 40 billion dead, uh, you know, a line in there. Uh, and it's like, yeah, it's this is not a war that was worth that yeah. sort of a, a, a price. There. Yeah, you could even have that. It's like, we've almost won this war. It's like, for what? What did all those people die for? Mm-hmm. If we could have prevented it before it started with 100 people. Mm-hmm. And then you get to have a fun discussion about whether or not it's okay for 100 people to sacrifice themselves to save a billion. Or 40. Or two. Somewhere between. Yeah. I mean, by the mm-hmm. end, it was it seemed like they only had two people on the ships. Yeah, well, that's the bridge crew. That's the only people that matter on the ship anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, if you have an engineer who is of any uh, note, they'll uh, they'll call up because this is a pre-TNG episode, uh, <laughs> starship here. They even <laughs> really do have a good thematic thing going on. You know, the kind of stuff that they could have done in DS9, uh, where 
the thing that prevents the war itself, this terrible thing that's destroying the Federation, is upholding your core principles and values, which is even though we are in like an uneasy peace, possibly almost wartime situation with the Klingons in the Enterprise C time, they still are responding to a distress call because they will always mm -hmm. sacrifice themselves for even the chance of helping other people. Yes. And that is yeah, the thing that makes the war not happen is the Federation actually upholding the values that it says it's going to uphold, even though it's the more difficult and dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to sort of, uh, I guess, do a big circle around that, you know, had, you know, something, uh, there was a mention of a, a pilot Archer four, uh, you know, you know, you know, maybe have questionable tactics or deployed or yeah. something like well, that. Well, you can have a whole thing. Like that's the fucking trade-off that you should have in this kind of episode like the federation is about to win but they had to sacrifice everything they are and represent to do it or you can do this thing which is exactly in line with their core values and will still require a sacrifice but will end better because it's in line with your core values and that should be the mm -hmm. thing that's making you decide what to do not this like fully stuck in certainty that you get from Guinan in this episode. It should be a, we will win either way. Either way, we're not going to be at war anymore. One way we're going to win, one way we send these people back to die. But at least this way, we're doing it as the Federation. And the other way, we've sacrificed everything we have to the point that there's no point in winning anymore. Yes, uh, we've uh, sold our soul for victory. Like, if you do so much to win, what are you even defending? It's a good question. Uh, it, it does remind me uh, a little bit of a, uh, a discussion that I, uh, you know, got from, uh, you know, sort of maybe second, third hand here uh, about uh, the funding of uh, particle accelerators in the, at the U.S. back in the 70s uh, that, uh, you know, a bunch of people were coming in to uh, sort of, you know, you know, discuss budgets and, you know, is this a good idea to be doing this sort of uh, science here? And, uh and the big military guy, you know, uh, you know, stood up and asked the questions like, "I, right, so you've talked a lot about various things here, but what, what is the, what is the military application for this?" And you know, one of the uh, people uh, from the science side, you know, you know, responded, "This is there. There is really nothing, no military application here, but it is one of the things that we can be doing that makes having a military, defending America, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera, worth doing that we are enriching our, 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 uh, our, ourselves, our civilization here, uh, whatever you want to call it, our country, um, by, by doing cool stuff here, by pushing the envelopes of, of uh, science here, uh, you know, doing, you know, a version of the right thing of let's do some basic research, uh, that, you know, it, it justifies your existence and the military guys like, I can go with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a little bit different here, but yeah. If you want a budget, you stroke off the military guy, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, it's also that, you know, very much a case of this guy kind of gets it that, you know, he's superfluous if there is not a, a, a substance to what you're trying to defend. And if, uh, you know, the Federation has lost that substance, then really what's the point of winning the war? Yeah, that's always been my issue with the way that they talk about war in any of these series. Because they always skirt around the like, oh, the Federation's really a military, etc., etc. And, you know, maybe, maybe not. We don't see enough of how it functions day to day to really know how fucking militaristic they're supposed to be. But... Mm -hmm. When you get into the endless war stuff in DS9, it's, oh, oh, see, see, you thought you lived in a utopia, but you have to sacrifice your values to survive. Who's the clever one now? Where you could have a thing of how much of your values can you sacrifice before you're just not fighting for anything worthwhile anymore? Why do you, the, you know, de facto point of view character, because you're the head of the show, get to make a decision to sacrifice the values of a thousand people because you think it's the right thing to do that they would have wanted? So, uh, when we get to, uh, in the pale moonlight, I, I suspect it might be an extra long yeah, episode, probably. folks. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because I think that's the thing that you could have. All of the people on the Enterprise C in this episode are ready to go back and sacrifice themselves because that's the thing they signed up to do. It yep. makes sense in the narrative we're presented. It makes sense with everything we're supposed to believe about the values of the Federation. Even if you're going into an unwinnable scenario, you will go back and you will do everything you can to try to save as many people as humanly possible because it's the thing you're there for. Indeed. So I, I, I do uh, like the uh, highlighting of uh, that sort of attitude, actually, uh, that you know, it's like even before there's a decision made about going back or not that, uh, you know, that it's, they're actually leaning towards uh, sticking around and helping the fight in the present uh, that, you know, it's like some of the crew are actually would prefer to go back in time there in order to uh, finish up the, that job here. Yeah. You know, sure, we might be needed here, but. You know, it, it, we were also needed there. We don't want to leave what we're doing halfway. This is the thing we we do. We explore space. We try to save people. We know it's dangerous. I think that's mm -hmm. infinitely more interesting than we got Garrick to tie them all up on the bridge and autopilot the thing back into the rift. Yep. <laughs> but it's fun because I mean, uh, it's Richard? morally questionable. <laughs> yeah. Alternative universe, uh, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there is uh, maybe something else we you know, to... Uh, address a little bit here about uh, the consequences of this episode. So in the uh, quote present here, things seem about the same, you know, there might be, you know, someone is on a different side of a room now, sort of stuff going on here, but there is, you know, generally we're back to where the timeline was before. However, Tasha going back in time does have ripples that uh, are going to uh, affect things that they haven't thought of yet quite in the uh, writing room uh, that are going to show up later. Yeah. <laughs> I think that depends on your theory of time travel. Because I think that you, there's an argument to be made that a lot of the stuff, some of the stuff in Star Trek is demonstrated to be alterable timeline stuff, but they always bring it back so readily that it seems like you've got the, um, I forget what you call it, there's definitely a word, but kind of the, anything that happened in the past is something that already happened. Yeah, well, it, it, it solved the determinism here. Yeah, so like, sort. Tasha went back in time and was on the Enterprise C, even though she wasn't born yet, because at this point in the future, the timeline wonkiness will happen and she will be sent back in time. Yep. You have always been back in time, even when you weren't. Yeah. <laughs> Which I guess is sort of my preferred take on time travel, that there is a certain amount of unknown about what actually has happened in the past, that you can have uh, uh, this predeterminism sort of happening, and it doesn't actually disrupt things in terms of, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm going to go back to time, uh, you know, in time today, and, you know, that doesn't matter, you know, in terms of, you know, a big alteration of the time tra uh, line. Um, though I guess in Star Trek, you have the inverse happening that if you come to the future, you can change things, mm. <laughs> which I guess, uh, is, a uh, a, a, a make in a weird way makes, uh, discovery second season make more sense. Still haven't gotten to that one. <laughs> Hint, there's uh, time travel involved. I know. Uh, as soon as they introduced the time travel stuff, I was like, Oh, this is so boring. And then I, <laughs> and, uh, when someone gets pulled on into the future, they're able to change uh, things after they left. Um, but when someone uh, uses the same technology to go back in time, they are effectively ensuring that their time that the current timeline that we've been watching uh, takes place. No, right, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's 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 a, it's a weird thing, <laughs> but uh, we could always. Uh, Def, uh, default to our 10th uh, doctor uh, option here <laughs> of uh, it's all timey wimey stuff mm. well I think that you get like you have a weird little deterministic um, outlier in here where like in order for this thing that happened in the past to happen this other weird complete anomaly has to happen that creates an actual alternate timeline for about 10 minutes Yep. that then <laughs> resolves itself and goes away <laughs> So uh, you you have to create a whole other universe effectively in order for ha have this actually happen. <laughs> so uh, uh, to quote Captain Janeway, uh, you know, uh, I, I I swore uh, day one I'd never get involved in any of these uh, paradoxes. 
Hmm. They had an interesting thing in um, one of the Michael Crichton books, Timeline. Very good book, very bad movie. <laughs> Where they had a whole, they have the whole deterministic sort of time travel thing. And one of the people starts asking us like, oh, I went, what if I went back in time and killed my grandfather? It's like, oh, you wouldn't. You, d you just wouldn't do that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't be able to. Maybe you wouldn't be able to find him. Maybe some other thing would happen. You, you just don't. Why would you do that? That's a weird thing to try to do. Maybe the uh, time travel device will malfunction just for that one's in attempt here. Mm -hmm. And you'll end up uh, 10,000 years ago. and uh, Or you'll end up in the future or something. And uh, you'll miss your target. Or you'll get there, meet your grandpa, and just chicken out. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you'll uh, attempt to get uh, to murder him. And uh, suddenly, you know, a alternative version of you from, you know, even further down your timeline shows up and, mur and tries to murder you, disrupting your intent. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, guy. <laughs> so be careful. Uh, I, I guess I do uh, enjoy in some of my own writing uh, you know, having fun with predeterminism of various sorts. Um, you know, in, in uh, one of the, uh, the novel length works I'm, uh, you know, doing some more editing on, uh, you know, there is a science that allows you to determine basically one thing to 100% certainty. However, you cannot do that for everything. You have to only do it one thing at a time. Uh, and if you determine that this person is going to be alive at this point in time, yeah, at some point at some uh, specific point in time in the future, yes, <laughs> they will be alive then, but how they get there could be very interesting. <laughs> that a, um, in the left hand of darkness, there's a whole thing about how they've the humanoid species on this planet has basically turned intuition into a thing that they can do with 100% certainty in certain situations. So they mm -hmm. can uh, definitely tell the future in certain ways, in certain with like certain ceremonies. And mm -hmm. uh, the guy, the insert character who's not from here, is like, "That's amazing! You could do so much with that." And they go, well, the one thing that anybody ever wants to know is, am I going to die? And the answer is always the same. So it's really not yes. that useful. <laughs> now I'm thinking about Crawl. <laughs> you ever see that? Oh, a long time ago. I don't remember anything about it. Uh, so for, uh, for our audience, uh, uh, Crawl is like a, a, a fantasy adventure uh, movie, except like aliens show up <laughs> I mean, that happened a lot in fantasy adventure movies if you've seen uh, anything from it it's the weird like switchblade throwing star thing yeah but uh one of the characters uh uh, uh is a, a cyclops and uh the uh you know he is blessed with the ability to tell the future but cyclopses only have the ability to tell the uh circumstances under their own death <laughs> yeah that's fun <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you exchange your eye for this power. Well, I'll let you see the future. Just a particular future. But anyway, uh, yesterday's Enterprise. Yeah. Great episode. It was. I like the episode. I just wish they could have done a little more with the, like, things they could have actually talked about. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, I, I guess in terms of having a quick end to sort of get the uh, main uh, decision sorted quickly with uh, Gein in there, I'm okay with. Um, cause you know, not only just alien stuff here, but, uh, you know, it, it, it does provide an opportunity to speed up some of the process. It does. Um, that's a little, it's a little unnecessary since the entire yeah. other crew is always like, can we, can we go back though? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it is, you know, potentially unnecessary, uh, you know, but, uh, in terms of the, I guess the flow of the episode, it works for me still. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, plus it's always fun to have guy in around. Yeah, that's true. She's always fun to have. Mm -hmm. You need to shoehorn her into things somehow. <laughs> uh, could, could, they could have always uh, done a thing where, uh, you know, a uh, guy looks at the time hole and he's like, no. And, uh, and then things change. And instead of being the, uh, uh the, the person, uh, tending the 10 forward, uh, sun tactical and like uh <laughs> <laughs> guy in the battle commando and you know you and just like change up the roles for everybody or something mm. like that <laughs> and you know and uh, wesley's still on the bridge of this episode but instead of doing the gray sweater thing he's uh you know in the uh uh you know uh, red uh, command stuff there you know uh, maybe he's down at the bar tending it. <laughs> 
giving advice to people. <laughs> well, they don't. They don't go into it fully. It makes sense, and is part of the whole decline of the Federation thing that they basically have recruited a teenager to be one of their like main bridge officers because they're pressed for people. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, I also uh, some of the uh, subtle things that uh, you know uh, are sort of being showcased that aren't being really sort of drawn attention to uh is like uh how picard addresses Riker, and it's like you know he's not number one in this episode for when they're in the alternative uh timeline he is commander mm-hmm. uh there is of course the uh, the obvious doohickey belt thing they got going on which is a little gaudy but uh it does mean that everyone can carry their weapons with them um even though before they could anyway it's like a clip on <laughs> uh yeah, you know, the, the, the uh, is I, I mentioned things about the decor of the, on the bridge. You know, having steps and uh, you know some of the sort of soft lines are sort of uh, covered up by various you know panels and you know weird strip things uh, to basically give it a harder feel. Um, even though the underlying structure of the bridge is the same, um, and yeah, so there's a lot of sort of subtle things like that uh, that are uh, done here to help showcase the otherness of this particular. Uh, timeline yeah they do a pretty good job and they're able it's inter- it's impressive how much they're able to change just by giving a few f- surface level details mm-hmm. so if you ever want to be in an alternative timeline that's what you got to do yeah just get a panel and put it up behind you, <laughs> you know, some paneling changes the whole vibe of the room <laughs> is is this the timeline where where you've gone evil or the timeline where uh you you kept up that conversation about uh you know, kinky sex uh, <laughs> Klingons and stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is this the evil timeline, or did everyone just get into uh, postmodern abstractionist minimalism? Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, there was also a mention of Doctor Salar today. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she, she's apparently still on the ship. Hooray! Good. <laughs> we have other doctors. <laughs> All right. Also, uh, uh, this is one of the episodes that was uh, featured in uh, a special time travel. Uh, uh, week uh, on the uh, local uh, Fox affiliate where I uh, grew up at one point. Nice. I also had like a full, before they had the full DVD seasons, I had this as one of the like Star Trek time travel episodes box sets of things. Mm. Nice. Mm. The time tra- Star Trek time travel episodes, Star Trek Q episodes, uh, Star Trek Tribble episodes that came with a Tribble. <laughs> that was only the two, so that's but still... A- <laughs> So that's uh, two thirds of Star Trek done. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and then the rest is uh, aliens being jerk asses. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have an aliens being jerks box set. But... <laughs> Unfortunate episodes. We'd rather you forget the box set. <laughs> Everything else. <laughs> hmm. Oh, I, I also want to point out the design of the Enterprise C. I, I rather appreciate it. It's a good mix of like a TOS Enterprise and like uh, TNG Enterprise kind of. A weird amalgamation vibe yeah. there. I was reading the thing that they they were able to do it relatively quickly because they'd already had to design it for the idea of let's have the st- enterprises through the ages in the conference room. Mm-hmm. So they were just like, well, I guess just make that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, just add a few windows and you're good. Anyway, that's all <laughs> I got. So okay, then we've we've been messing around too much. I'm tired and I'm gonna keep saying weird shit until I fall asleep. Ah. If uh, we don't do the galaxy's favorite game show. Hey everybody, welcome to the galaxy's favorite go go away uh, version of me that's really grim dark. Anyway, the uh, galaxy's favorite game show. Our various contestants have been uh, uh, getting some. Uh, no, no, st- stop. Don't, don't run off. Geppen, could you like taser him? Uh, never mind. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, uh, our various contestants have been uh, collecting uh, some points here. And uh, though uh, the the prizes maybe have uh, some temporal instability, I think they'll be uh, good enough for today. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get started. The first prize is the Time Warp Prize, which goes to the Enterprise C and all aboard. Uh, that includes you, uh, Castillo, and uh, yeah, the captain and all that, and everyone you don't see. Um, and everyone all aboard here. Uh, you know, manage to get themselves pulled to the future, uh, and then they go back. And uh, I guess the explanation for the uh, why there's a time hole here is that the Robinson's weapons are weird. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what do they win, Gapwood? 
they win the infinite time loop because they could just go back, uh, go through the time hole again, go back for 10 seconds, keep getting repaired. It's basically save scumming, uh, <laughs> but for <laughs> ships. Yeah. Go th pop out, shoot them, take some damage, pop back in, repair your ship, pop back out, shoot them. <laughs> Eventually we'll end up in a timeline where the uh, this one ship uh, somehow conquered the entire Romulan Empire and... Uh, yeah, uh, destroyed the, the the board before our first contact with yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen this is how this is how some people are playing Baldur's Gate three honor mode. It's like I can run mm. in and keep one guy off to the back, and then we'll die, and then he'll heal us all, and then you know, we'll fight them a little more, and then we'll die, and then he'll resurrect us at camp, and then. <laughs> or uh, playing uh, Rim World, where you uh, hang out in a little shack and just uh, shoot everyone that comes in, uh, towards you. Uh, and then uh, you, you go inside and close the door, and they're like, oh, there's something else to attack that's not behind the door, so I'm going to go attack that. <laughs> and you do it again forever. Um, anyway, our uh, second prize is the assignment death prize, which goes to Tashiar for volunteering for a likely suicide motion in the hopes that, uh, a mission that, uh, in the hopes that she'll uh, have a worthy death, hopefully, and uh, hopefully she won't be captured by the Romulans. Uh, what does she win, Gip? She what? wins an update to her epitaph when they find out what actually is going on so that she can have the whole worthy death, I'll be remembered thing. Also, mm -hmm. I'm glad they gave it another reason because they were so close to I want to go back in time and die because I like the boy and like keep it in your pants. Yes. Yeah, well, uh, getting yourself killed because you're falling in love like that uh, with like just a few hours of time to hang out. Not a good look. Um... Yeah. Uh, our final prize today is the Plot Vibes Prize, which goes to Guinan for basically just having a feeling that she's hanging out in the wrong timeline. Uh, you know, it gets things going, but, you know, whatever. What does she win? She Gepard? wins some crystals, hanging herbs, one of those neon signs that says psychic with the eye on it. It's like, maybe if you mm -hmm. had to come to that in her quarters, you'd be more inclined to believe that she has weird extra dimensional time knowledge. Indeed. Hmm. What if I have interdimensional time knowledge? Do you have crystals and would herbs? That, would, would that mean that the all the prizes I hand out are for alternative universes? Yeah, probably. That's why none of it makes any sense. Oh, gosh. Gep would take us away before it gets worse. Ah. Yeah, thanks to whatever temporal rift you came in from for joining us on the galaxy's favorite game show. <laughs> Apparently, I made it back to our original timeline, hopefully. Yeah, seems like. Yeah, I just think it's funny, since we were making fun of this for being grimdark, I went over to Wikipedia to check the next episode, and I, I forgot they now have their color thing. It's just as automatic, light, dark. <laughs> Should I set it to dark for our dark themes? The darkest time for an episode. <laughs> Go! <laughs> but uh, the, the next episode uh, has... A, a, a dark conclusion, but uh, is kind of fun at times yeah. and uh, features uh, at least one uh, detached limb, but you know. So the next one's going to be interesting. I'm not going to spoil mm -hmm. it, but it's got some themes that could be relevant to some stuff we're talking about today that I don't see very many people talk about with this episode. Hmm. And uh, does it ha uh, a choice uh, hairdo? No. I don't know enough about hair. Should ask somebody yeah. who knows more about hairstyling. Mm. Uh, a, a, a awkwardly uh, uh, appearing admiral who uh, lectures people. I mean, we get those in most episodes. Okay, so. yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, we are maybe going to be uh, doing some cybernetics. Yeah, we've got yes the offspring, which is uh, basically the episode whose offspring you may ask. That's not the one yeah, you'd so. expect. Yes, uh, clearly. Um, the answer will Riker, shock you. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, Riker's not the, uh, the not the father this time either, um, and and also not Kirk. Uh, you know, you have to check sometimes. Yeah, so <laughs> that one's interesting. <laughs> sometimes it Kirk, is Kirk. We thought you were dead. It might be Kirk. We don't know. <laughs> um, and it's not Diana because she already had her awkward episode where she has a kid. Um. Crusher already has at least one kid. Um, clearly, the answer is going to be Worf. Yeah, he's Worf is is definitely uh, going to be showing up here with a kid, 
and it's going to be a whole thing, right? Yeah, I mean, that is something we know happens. Yeah, so uh, this is clear that epi- clearly that episode. Or that, so. like, illegitimate kid that they keep, like, sort of trying to tease for Picard at various points, but never do anything with. Yeah. <laughs> hmm, Thankfully, because that would be weird and awkward and bad. So, uh... Yeah, let's uh, let's uh, roll forward, and uh, we'll uh, find out if I'm correct with my estimation. Yes, next time I, you I, find out who's offspring, <laughs> who's the daddy or mommy. Let's roll. Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Data collects a severed foot. have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcasts, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more. And where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and Mori's Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs>